At this point, you've been introduced to the idea of gates, and you're familiar with the idea that gates tend to change with increasing speed. We've talked about changing from a walking to a running gait at a certain speed, and you'll also recall that the main difference that we've talked about between a walking and a running gait is the incorporation of an aerial phase and a running gait. So in this web lecture, we're going to start to think about adaptations and specializations in vertebrates for high-speed running, what we call cursorial locomotion, cursorial locomotion, and particularly in mammals, and see what kinds of adaptations are going to best suit an animal for high-speed running. So first, let's take a look at what we mean when we talk about running velocity. So the velocity in terms of terrestrial locomotion is going to be equal to the stride length. By stride length, we mean the distance traveled by the center of mass in a single stride. Remember from the Gates web lecture that a stride involves the complete cycling of all of the feet that are involved. So from foot down of one particular foot, say left hind foot, through the foot downs of all the other feet, back to the foot down of the left hind foot again is one stride. So how far the center of mass travels forward in a single stride times the stride frequency, how many strides per second the animal takes. So if you want to think of this in terms of units, stride length would be a distance, say like meters per stride. Stride frequency would be in units of strides per second, so the strides cancel out when you multiply them, you get meters per second. That's the forward velocity of the animal. And so there are two factors that can be manipulated when increasing running speed. So reptiles tend to go faster by increasing their stride frequency. They're just gonna cycle their limbs at a faster rate. Whereas mammals in general, tend to go faster by increasing stride length, and they have many adaptations for increasing that stride length. The first we've already talked about, changing to a gait with an aerial phase is going to help to increase the stride length. Why? Because when you always have at least one foot in contact with the ground, you're limited in how far forward you can go by the length of your limb. When you incorporate an aerial phase where you're pretty much leaving the ground and jumping forward or propelling yourself forward, you're no longer limited by the length of your limbs in terms of how far you can go in a stride. So incorporating the aerial phase is very important to increasing the stride length. They also have a tendency to increase the length of the limbs, and we will talk in a little bit about some of the reasons they're able to do that. And they also tend to increase the number of limb segments. So let's take a closer look at what we mean by that. So what do we mean when we talk about a limb segment? We can think of a limb segment as being the part of a limb between two joints. So in this case, in this what we call plantigrade posture, there are several limb segments that are in contact with the ground. We've got the phalanges, then there's a joint between the metatarsals and the phalanges. So there's the phalanges can um, constitute one segment, and then the, between the metatarsals and the ankle joint is another segment. Both of these segments are kept flat on the ground. We can see this calcaneum, which is an extension of one of the tarsal bones sticking out behind uh, as a reference point. And so plantigrade posture is what we humans use, bears use it, raccoons, uh, several different kinds of animals that are not specialized for high-speed locomotion use this plantigrade posture with just two limb segments incorporated into what we'd call the functional leg. So this is what we'd call the functional foot, the part in contact with the ground, and then the part above that that's not in contact with the ground, we'll call that the functional leg. If we look at another posture, this one is known as digitigrade. This is the posture used by cats and dogs and many other um, cursorial species. We see one of these segments incorporated into the functional leg. The metatarsals are up off the ground and become part of the functional leg. 
they become elongated and increase the overall limb length. So my daughter likes to think of this as sort of the, the beginning ballerina posture where you're up on your tippy toes, but the phalanges are still in contact with the ground forming the functional foot. In the ungulate grade posture, this is the posture that is obviously taken by ungulates, hoofed uh, mammals such as horses and antelopes and all kinds of hoof stock. Now the phalanges are also incorporated into this functional leg and it's just this highly modified um, claw or fingernail, the hoof, that is the functional foot in contact with the ground and so my daughter likes to call this the professional ballerina on point position. Um, so we've got kind of toddler ballerina with the whole foot on the ground, beginner ballerina up on tippy toes and then finally the professional ballerina on point. Extending that limb again more by incorporating yet another segment into the functional leg. So we can say for high speed, more limb segments are incorporated into the functional leg and fewer into the functional foot to increase that overall leg length. And of course, increasing the leg length is also going to increase the stride length. But it turns out that yet another limb segment is added just by this change in posture that we've talked about that we see in synapsids in the mammals as compared to um, the more basal uh, amniote condition of this sprawled limb posture. So remember we said that the legs are brought down more underneath the body and are going to support the weight more directly straight above so that glenoid fossa the articulation between the humerus and the scapula is going to be pointing downward rather than outward, and the legs are going to swing in a parasagittal plane, straight forward and back. And so this change in the orientation of the limb movements means that these legs are swinging completely in the direction of travel. All of the movement of the limbs is going to be straight forward when it's walking. There's not going to be these sort of lateral excursions that are going to reduce the distance that limb travels going forward the way you would see in a sprawled posture. So the limbs swinging in the direction of travel also increases that stride length. We also discovered when we discussed this in class is that this change in posture tends to load these bones of the limb in compression rather than bending. And remember that bone is the strongest in compression, so it's going to be able to withstand more compression force per unit of cross-sectional area than it would be able to withstand a bending force. So placing these bones in loading means that these bones can become a lot longer and a lot more slender and still have enough strength to withstand those compression loads. What we also saw associated with this change in posture is a reduction in those ventral skeletal elements, the loss of the coracoid that tended to free the scapula up from any kind of bony connections with the axial skeleton or with the bones on the other side of the body. So the, the scapula are now free to move and rotate. So just to remind you of this muscular sling that we see in mammals, Remember, the scapula is only attached to the axial skeleton through these muscular connections. So because this is soft, stretchy muscle tissue, the scapula can move and rotate. And we see this um, if we look at these drawings based on x-rays of a possum while it's walking. You can see that this scapula go undergoes a pretty large excursion through a stride, looking at both a dorsal view and also a lateral view. You can see the scapula really rotates and actually becomes an additional limb segment, uh, increasing the functional length of that limb. So adding to this list we're building, we can see that we increase the number of limb segments by using a digitigrade or unguligrade posture, and then animals can also incorporate the scapula into that movement to further increase the functional length of the limbs to be able to increase that stride length. One final mechanism that animals use to increase their stride length is vertebral flexion. So flexion and extension of the vertebral column. And this can be seen very easily, especially in big cats that have a very flexible back. So we see in this cheetah, when it's in its gathered position, it sort of scrunches up the back 
and then it can flex and extend that vertebral column to be able to stretch and reach even further in that stride to be able to increase the distance that its body goes in that stride. We see this to a lesser extent, but still somewhat in more stiff-backed mammals such as horses that can also use this vertebral flexion to a certain extent to be able to increase their stride length. So we've seen all of these ways that mammals increase their stride length to overcome the limitation of increasing your speed by increasing stride frequency. Stride frequency is basically limited by the speed with which muscles contract, the speed with which the muscle can actually pull a limb forward. But it turns out that mammals also use some mechanical tricks to increase that stride frequency also by being able to swing the limbs at a higher rate of speed. So let's see how this mechanism works. We call this the summation of angular velocities of multiple segments. So let's see how this works. So the easiest way to think about this is think about when you're walking forward on either like the moving walkway at the airport or up an escalator, your total velocity is the sum of the speed at which you're walking and also the speed at which that floor is already moving. So you're increasing your speed by summing those two individual velocities because they're being used in conjunction. So if we think about angular rotations, so swinging around a pivot point, if we first start with the scapula and we say that the scapula is rotating due to a muscle acting on it, so it's going to rotate at a particular speed of x degrees per second, and that's limited by the speed at which the muscle can shorten. So remember we saw some tricks to increase muscle shortening speed, but basically muscle can only get so long, there's gonna be a limit to how fast the muscle can actually contract. So let's say the maximum is x degrees per second. So that's the speed that the scapula is moving. But let's say that also the humerus is moving relative to the scapula due to the muscle contractions of the muscles attached to it at another x degrees per second. So again, it's limited, but let's say its maximum is x degrees per second. So now, because both of those are moving simultaneously, we've got a total rotational velocity of the humerus of 2x degrees per second. We've doubled that rotational velocity by summing those velocities. Let's say that the elbow joint is also rotating the antibrachium at x degrees per second. Now we've got a total rotational velocity of the antibrachium, the radius and ulna part of the limb. The antibrachium is now rotating at 3x degrees per second, and if we add rotations of the more distal segments, we can get a total rotational velocity multiplied by the number of limb segments just by rotating all of those limb segments simultaneously. So that's a mechanical trick that mammals use as a result of having uh, this large number of limb segments incorporated into the functional leg. There are also ways that mammals have of decreasing the total energetic cost of rotating those limbs. And this is by manipulating a factor called moment of inertia. This is a little bit of a complicated concept, but I'll break it down for you um, and simplify it the best I can. We saw that there was a specialized version of the concept of force that applied when you apply a force around a pivot point called a moment. So a moment is the force times the distance, and it's a special kind of force that we think about when it's applied at some distance from a pivot. We can also think of a special version of mass of a limb segment that depends on how far any unit of mass is away from a pivot point on something that's rotating, and this is the moment of inertia. So. This replaces mass for rotational motion. So just as force is equal to mass times acceleration, we can think of torque, the rotational force, as I, which is the moment of inertia, times alpha, which is the angular acceleration, the acceleration at which it is rotating around that pivot. Okay, with me so far. So moment of inertia is a special way of representing mass when we're talking about movement around a pivot. And the way this is measured is we take whatever this is that's rotating, let's say this limb is rotating around the elbow joint, and the way we would do this if we we're actually analyzing an animal is to just literally cut it up into pieces. We call this slice and dice if we have a cadaver, and weigh each segment 
each uh, slice that we cut off. So we'd weigh this little bit here. Um, ideally, you'd want to do it at even increments along the entire limb. This is just an example. So you weigh this segment, weigh this segment, weigh all the segments, including bone and muscle and everything that's there. And then the total of this moment of inertia is going to depend on the mass of the segment times the square of the distance of that segment to the center of rotation. So we take the elbow joint, and for this segment here, it would be the mass times the square of the center of the segment to the elbow joint, plus the mass of this segment times the distance between uh, this uh, segment and the center of rotation squared. So it depends on the mass of the segment and the square of the distance from the segment. So the goal for reducing the energetic cost is to minimize the moment of inertia. We want this to be as small as possible, then we are actually functionally moving a smaller amount of mass. So what we tend to see in animals that are adapted for running is most of the mass concentrated proximally, right? So to minimize that distance to the center of rotation. So that that mass is not having a squared impact on the energetic cost of rotating that. If you had a whole bunch of mass out here, and you're talking about the square of the distance to this joint, that's going to really increase the impact of any mass that's located here far away from the center of rotation. So what we see is most of the bulky muscles proximally, and you probably saw this in your cat dissection out here in the distal part of the limb. What you see is not a lot of bulky muscles, but long, slender tendons that are going to operate these more distal elements, keeping most of the mass and most of the bulk closer to the center of rotation to minimize that moment of inertia. So to minimize the moment of inertia, as we just said, we want to concentrate the mass proximally, close to the joint. So now let's just complete our list and review. So we saw that velocity depends on two factors, stride length and stride frequency. We see that reptiles in general tend to go faster by increasing stride frequency. Uh, mammals additionally um, have a lot of specializations and adaptations to increase their stride length, including this change in gait. And we can see very extreme aerial phases as we see here in the cheetah. Increasing the length of the limbs, again, we see this very dramatically in species such as deer and antelope, other things specialized for very fast running. Increasing the number of limb segments by using digitigrade or ungulate grade posture and also incorporating the scapula as a functional unit and also vertebral flexion. And we just saw that mammals also have some tricks that they can use to increase the speed with which they uh, move the limbs, increasing the stride frequency and that would be the summation of angular velocities of the multiple segments. And then we also saw how the moment of inertia of a limb can be decreased by locating muscles and larger bones proximally to decrease that moment of inertia, keeping everything short distance from the center of rotation. And this is going to save on the energetic cost. It's functionally equivalent to moving less mass if you locate it closer to the center of rotation. So these are the adaptations we're going to be putting into practice in class next time when we think about how we might build a robot that incorporates these factors to win the running race.